Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video series about advanced topics in linear algebra. And in today's part 40, we will talk about a special block diagonalization we have for a linear map and given invariant subspaces. And as you might already guess at this point, this result is what we will use to prove the Jordan normal form. However, before we go back to that, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And moreover, you can also download a lot of additional material for all the videos with the link in the description. For example, there you also find additional videos like exercises and solutions. And now without further ado, I would say we can immediately start with the proposition of today. There as always, we will consider a general f-vector space V. And in addition, we also take a linear map L that maps V into V. And please don't forget, in our linear algebra course, we always assume that we consider finite dimensional vector spaces. And now the claim of this proposition will be that this linear map can be represented by a matrix that has a block diagonal structure. And this only makes sense if we have two special subspaces of V given. So let's call them u1 and u2, and these are subspaces that satisfy two properties. First, the direct sum of the two subspaces should be equal to v. So we already know this just means that both subspaces together span the whole vector space v, and the intersection of u1 with u2 is only the zero vector. So you could say this means we have a decomposition of v into two parts. And moreover, the second property tells us that this decomposition also holds for the linear map L. This simply means that each subspace is invariant under our linear map L. There you know what it means, the subspace is simply mapped into the same subspace again. So if this one is u1, then the image of u1 lies inside u1 again. So this is what it means to be invariant under L. And in order to be precise, the formula would be that the image of u1 under L is a subset in u1. And exactly the same thing we also want to have for u2 as well. So these are all the assumptions we need, and then we have a matrix representation of L in block form. More concretely, we have a 2 times 2 block matrix in diagonal form. Or to put it in a general context, we would say that we find a basis B of V such that the corresponding matrix representation is of this form. And indeed, we can even say how large the blocks are in our 2 times 2 matrix. And please note, they don't have to have the same size at all. And we don't know anything about the numbers inside the blocks, but outside we only have zeros. So we would write that the rectangular blocks here and there are filled up with zeros. But obviously we know the sizes of the block because they are given by the dimensions of the subspaces. For the first square the dimension of u1 gives the size, so we have dimension of u1 times dimension of u1. And then the other one is simply given by the dimension of u2. This fits together because if we add the two dimensions, we get the dimension of v. Okay, so this is the whole claim. If we have these assumptions, then we always find a basis of v such that we have this nice matrix representation. Hence, in the proof, we just have to find such a nice basis b. And as always for the matrix representation, it's good to look at the picture of the corresponding maps. So here we have our map L, and then we can translate the abstract vector space V into the concrete one given by Fn. And as you know, this is always done by a so-called basis isomorphism given by a map phi B. So you see, what we want is to choose the same basis B on the left and on the right hand side. And then we simply get our matrix representation here on the lower level. Therefore, the corresponding linear map is always calculated by this composition. And since this is always the correct picture, the only thing we have to do now is to choose a suitable basis b. And since the dimension of v is fixed with n, we have exactly n vectors in our basis. And now the overall idea is to first choose a basis of our subspace u1. 
Hence, we would say we go until an index alpha, where alpha is given as the dimension of u1. This means the first alpha vectors here span the whole subspace u1. And then the rest of the vectors have to span our second subspace u2. So essentially what we do is to choose a basis of u1 and u2, and then we put it together to get a basis of v. This is always possible because we have the direct sum of u1 plus u2 is equal to v. And indeed, this is the essential idea because now we have the decomposition in our basis b. Therefore, now we can put in our second assumption, which means the invariance of our subspaces. It implies that we know what happens to a vector from the basis bj when we put it into our linear map L. Namely, it stays in the corresponding subspace, so in the first case, it stays in our u1. Hence, this case we have if j is chosen between 1 and alpha. And on the other hand, if we choose the index from the second part, then we stay in u2. So the invariance just tells us that we cannot leave the given subspace. However, now the thing is that the basis isomorphism translates a given basis vector to a canonical unit vector. So as a reminder, b2 would be mapped to e2. And e2 is the vector in fn, which starts with a 0, then comes a 1, and then only zeros. And obviously a similar thing happens to all basis vectors under our map phi b. Therefore we can also translate and rewrite the whole element relation from before for our matrix representation lbb. So if we apply ej to it and j comes from 1 to alpha, then we also land in the span of the first canonical unit vectors. And please note that all these canonical unit vectors have zeros at the bottom. In other words, this already explains our first block in the matrix representation. Okay, so now to finish everything, we can do the same thing for the other basis vectors. And then we see we have the zeros on the top for these canonical unit vectors. And there we have it. With that, we can write down our block matrix representation. And there, please note, the first alpha columns are described by our first element relation here. Therefore, this square definitely has size alpha times alpha. And then the second element relation describes the second square, which has size n minus alpha. And by definition, alpha is the dimension of the first subspace and n minus alpha the dimension of the other one. So this finishes our proof here, and now you know what such a general block diagonalization means. And as I told you at the beginning of the video, we can immediately apply that to our Jordan normal form proof. Namely, there we have our generalized eigenspaces, which are invariant under A. To explain that correctly, let's look at our assumptions again. We have a complex square matrix A and an eigenvalue lambda of A. And then in order to make the notation simple, we always define the matrix N as A minus lambda identity matrix. And then we know that we have a generalized eigenspace, which is given as the kernel of N to the power D. And we also have shown that we have a special power D here, which is called the fitting index. And now please recall from former videos that the kernel and the range of N to the power D are invariant under A. So we definitely already have our invariant subspaces. In addition to that, the last video also has shown that we have the direct sum of both subspaces. And please note, the result is the whole space we consider. Hence, our nice proposition from above is applicable and we get the following nice result. Namely, the matrix A is similar to such a block diagonal matrix from before. So maybe we cannot transform A into a diagonal matrix, but we can definitely transform it into a 2 times 2 block diagonal matrix. And moreover, we also know the sizes of the blocks, because the first one here should be the dimension of our kernel. This might be quite interesting, because it's the dimension of a generalized eigenspace. And in addition to that, we also know that the characteristic polynomials of A and this 2 times 2 block diagonal matrix are the same. And I already promised you, this fact is what we will use in the next video. 
So I really hope I meet you there again and have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you.